On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to talk about a battle in the heavens. We know that during the last days, there will be a royal battle, not just on earth among humans, but between God's angels and the demonic forces of Lucifer. Gary Sturman is here to discuss with me this heavenly battle. Mm. And J.R., the heavenly battle will rage in the last days, and I expect it will come to a, a very great climactic end. But you know it's been going on for centuries, and I think it goes on even as we speak. And we're going to look at the battle in the heavens uh, really as an outgrowth of our conversations on the primeval light. We've discussed uh, in uh, earlier programs, J.R., that uh, there is, the battle really can be characterized as a battle of light versus darkness. Uh, uh, the creatures of light, the angels, versus the creatures of darkness, led by the prince of darkness himself, Satan. And uh, we're going to begin in Daniel as we look at this battle and get, try to get some insight into what's going on. Uh, now, Gary, we know there are angels, and we know there are demons. They must surely have some kind of interaction in this world. Mm -hmm. We have heard through history that there are, uh, what, fairies and leprechauns and all kinds of folklore about oh, yeah. some other, other unearthly, otherworldly creatures that are out there. And of course, in the Bible, we have the stories of angels interacting with people, and such uh, will be the case today in Daniel chapter 10, mm -hmm. as Daniel encounters an angel. Um, the UFO phenomena of late surely must have some kind of connection because there are too many of these reports mm -hmm. for it to just be a figment of men's imagination. Well, J.R., uh, many writers ha have pointed out uh, the history of what are called demonic phenomena on the face of the earth. Uh, as you mentioned, fairy lore, there are legends of elves and little people, and uh, uh, there are legends concerning <clears throat> enchantments and spirit beings. All of this, I think, comes under the heading of demonic phenomena, uh, even to the extent that uh, the demons seem to be able to shift their field depending on which culture they're dealing with. For example, in the 19th century, we had the famous airship phenomena uh, in which what appeared to be helium balloons powered by old-fashioned steam engines would steam across the sky and occasionally land and ask for a drink of water. You know, the occupants there would ask the uh, farmer, farmer John if he had some water and, and Farmer John would say, yes, I do. Where are you from? And they'd say, well, we're from China. And this is extremely well documented and, and what I believe was going on was uh, that in every age there is a demonic presence and it modifies itself to suit the current perception of technology. So today, the demons have said, well, let's see, what would modern man react to? <laughs> I know, let's make ourselves look like space aliens. Yes. We'll appear as space aliens and we'll spread the lie that we're coming from outer space. And so... And be in some kind of high-tech vehicles. In a high-tech looking vehicle. And so the demonic uh, lore has shifted with the culture down through the ages. For so example, you... the days of Alexander the Great. Uh -huh. Alexander and his men saw what they called a flying shield that was flying through the air and it buzzed around over the troops. Well, today we call that a flying saucer. But uh, the point is that uh, in every age there has been an encounter with, let's call them flying angels, led by the prince of darkness, or the Bible calls him the prince of the power of the air. And, uh, and, and this battle seems to be coming to a conclusion in our day, uh, getting ready for a conclusion. Uh, a lot of UFO flaps uh, wow, yes. in the last few years. That's right. And another one, I, I, as I understand it, another one is on, on the way of beginning. Uh, well, in, in Mexico, uh, there have been just literally thousands of sightings, and people routinely take videotape films of little silver spheres flying around uh, over Mexico City. Uh, Monterey, Mexico has been, been a big uh, UFO site, and then this is sort of... Uh, uh, creep, crept northward into the southern United States. Uh, Arizona has seen a number of UFO uh, appearances. New Mexico, Texas now. Uh, and so, uh, yes, we do appear to be having another, uh, as, the, as it's called, UFO flap. In the days of the Bible, 
the chariot was the vehicle of uh, the mass uh, or the uh, armies and uh, most populations. They had ox carts, some kind of vehicle pulled by horses. And that appears to be the description given of the heavenly vehicles that fly around. Mm -hmm described in the days of uh, Daniel. Let's talk about Daniel chapter 10 for just a moment. It says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, but the time appointed was long. In other words, this thing that was revealed would take a long time to work mm -hmm. out. And of course, this is following the abomination of desolation in the story of the 70 weeks. And so I, I get from this that the thing that was revealed to him was the information that had been given to him by Gabriel just a few verses prior to this, the 70 weeks, uh -huh. and the 70th week being the tribulation period and the abomination of desolation there. And that's to be a time, we know from the book of Revelation, that's, that's to be a time when this battle in the heavens really breaks out. It becomes, I think, highly visible. But in its invisible form, uh, we read about it in the 10th chapter, of Daniel, in which Daniel had fasted and prayed for 21 days and, and uh, was visited by a vision of the pre-incarnate Christ, or let's put it this way, the same Christ that John saw uh, in Revelation, the, the man in white linen. And then he was also visited apparently by an angel, and the, the uh, Hebrew commentaries say it was the angel Gabriel. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gabriel says to Daniel in, uh, in Daniel 10, 13, uh, I, I heard your prayer 21 days ago. And then he says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. And he's talking about something we would almost think of as a space battle. Mm. The spa the, maybe the airspace over Persia uh, in which these super beings are contesting uh, in the, within that region and, and going head to head and mm -hmm. fighting each other. And here Gabriel says it took me 21 days and I had to get Michael's help. So this was an other dimensional type battle that was going on, mm -hmm. not of, among humans, but among angels and uh, fallen angels. Right. The prince of Persia must have been a demonic uh, being whose job it was mm -hmm. to, to govern over the uh, politics of the land in Persia at that time. Kind of interesting to me. Let's set the scene here. We've got Daniel down by the river. Yes. Um, the river Hadical, and uh, uh, the more modern name for this river would be the Euphrates. the Euphrates River. And he sees a vision of this man. Now, over in chapter 12, this man clothed in linen is on the river. And uh, I think that's kind of interesting that he sees this. The, the man clothed in linen, verse 6 of chapter 12, mm -hmm. which was upon the waters of the river. So when Daniel looks out upon the river, he sees this man either in a boat or standing on the water. And uh, it, he knows immediately that it is a heavenly being. Yes. In fact, he has three friends with him who run for cover. They run for cover because they, the, the appearance is, is so fierce and so otherworldly. You know, J.R., the thing that impresses me about this is that Daniel receives a prophetic vision that, ex, that, that spans uh, the time from his own day until the far future, time mm -hmm. of the Great Tribulation. And the prophecy deals with the princes of Persia, and the prince of Greece, and then later with Rome and the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And these are the princes he's fighting. Because he says in verse 20 of uh, chapter 10 to Daniel, Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? You know why I'm coming to you, is what it says. And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. These forces that he's fighting with are the very subject of the prophecy that he receives. Now, the Prince of Greece didn't come for 200 years. That's right. Alexander the Great 
Of course, this Prince of Greece here is the demonic uh, entity who's motivating mm -hmm. um, Alexander the Great. But that's 200 years off. And yet he says, when I'm gone forth, the Prince of Greece shall come. So he's looking into the future, mm -hmm. and he speaks of it as if it's, uh, what, this afternoon? Yeah, or a few day after tomorrow. Or so. It's you know? amazing. Now, we're going to, uh, we're approaching a break, but when we come back, and we're going to address the question, are we seeing battles in the heavens today that are visible to our eyes? We'll be back in just a moment. Our story opens with Daniel and three friends on the banks of the Euphrates when suddenly Daniel and the men get a vision of Christ. The pre-incarnate or post-incarnate Christ, it is Christ, the same Christ we see in the book of the Revelation. He's on the river. And Daniel falls down on his face. The three men scatter. They go hide. And then Gabriel touches Daniel on the shoulder and says, Sit up, Daniel. Stand up, Daniel. I've got something to tell you about. He tells him the story of the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, and from the Seleucids will come the Antichrist. This mm -hmm. is a fascinating story that unfolds here because of this battle mm -hmm. between light and darkness. The battle between light and darkness, and we have this incarnation of uh, Christ visiting Daniel, and his appearance is like lightning and molten metal and flames. Uh, he is ablaze with light and, and is always on the side of light. And you know, J.R., what's fascinating to me about the 11th chapter of Daniel, hands down, without any question, it's the most complex chapter in the entire Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, to do a study of Daniel 11 would take weeks. It we covers were, a lot of history in just a few verses. In a very few verses, it covers world history, uh, the, the uh, I guess we could say the genealogy of the Antichrist mm -hmm. from the time of, uh, of Persia until the final emergence of the man of sin. And, and isn't it interesting, he talks about these demonic creatures as being the prince of Persia and the right. prince of Greece. And so this family is going to have some mm -hmm. kind of interaction with demonic forces. Right, and it is the very embodiment of, the, of Paul's writing in verse uh, 12 of Ephesians 6. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness. And that's the word to keep in mind, the and, operative word here. Yeah, and to me, the underlying theme here is demon seed. Yeah. You know, go back to Genesis chapter 6, and the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and, and, and bred with them, brought forth giants, our men of renown. And uh, mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about chapter 2 of Daniel for just a moment. You know, this, this vision of the monster man seen by Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. We get down to the feet of iron and clay. That's two different entities. The yeah, iron really being the, of men of the Roman Empire and the clay being something else. It says... Whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Now the only thing mm -hmm. other than the seed of men would be the seed of um, angels, fallen yeah, or otherwise. That's right. It's kind of fascinating that Daniel's uh, uh, explanation to Nebuchadnezzar of world history in a statue. Mm -hmm. You have a head, eventually it comes down, it splits into two legs, mm -hmm. uh, which many have said are the eastern and western divisions of the Roman Empire. And that finally the feet, and in the days of the feet and the toes, there, there becomes a debasing of the material of the statue. It started out as gold and it ended up in iron mixed with clay. And J.R., this is the most perfect image of what happened in Genesis chapter 6 when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, chose wives. Mm -hmm. They'd so debased the human genome that God said, that's had to it. destroy the human race. I have to he? destroy the human race. And he chose Noah along with seven other people whose genetic heritage was pure and brought them through the flood and started the whole thing out over again. Well, uh, when Daniel says here in ex explaining the statue, whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men has to be other than men. Mm -hmm. And the next sentence is fascinating, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. In other words, 
uh, an attempt will be made to corrupt the human genome once again. Yes. But it will not work. That's the good news. Yes. Well, you know, when we get to chapter 11, verse 21, we go from the Ptolemies and the Seleucids to the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. From verse 20 to 21, That's suddenly right. in his estate shall stand up a vile person. Uh, this to me sounds like the Antichrist will be of Seleucid background, mm -hmm. but demon seed mixed. A, a vile. An alien human hybrid. Which, now, if, if you're beginning to say out there, well, hold on, J.R. We're, we're talking UFO abductions here, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, <laughs> J.R. and Gary have lost it. Uh, uh, but we want to demonstrate, uh, and, and we're going to, we won't have time to finish this today, but we want to demonstrate to you that there is a battle in the heavens going on, and the battle involves the corruption of humanity. Jesus said, as it was in the yeah. days of Noah. Now, the days of Noah, J.R., are, are seen in Genesis chapter 6, and they, uh, the, the, the feature that marks the days of Noah is the genetic corruption of mankind. Now, Gary, you've you got to admit that only in this generation, in this 20th century, mm -hmm. have men learned that we are made up, our human bodies are made up of a DNA program. Yeah some kind of mix, and every one of us are different, but we are all made up of this basic genetic structure. Up until then, uh, nobody knew that we were made up of some kind of scientifically uh, contrived uh, DNA program right? To, so that our eyes would be either blue or brown or so on, and our hair would be a certain color and features uh, as they are. Now, when we get over to Daniel 9, uh, Daniel chapter 11 and verse 39, we've got, we've got what appears to be an alien um, mm -hmm. presence among the human race. As a matter of fact, reading that, uh, we have this, thus shall he do, to he being the, the Antichrist, in the most strongholds with a strange God one whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many. Yeah. Well, J.R., who, who are they who are ruling over many? They're these beneficent aliens and the UFOs that are going to come and save the human race from uh, <laughs> nuclear war. <laughs> the subject of practically every motion picture lately. There you go. I've, I'm holding a book here that was uh, published a couple of years ago, uh, very well received, uh, by Dr. John Mack. He is a Harvard professor, an MD, a psychiatrist. The man has credentials that go all the way as oh, far as you... Yeah. <laughs> and he writes this. The pioneering work of UFO investigators Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs has shown what is amply corroborated in my cases, namely that the abduction phenomenon is in some central way involved in a breeding program that results in the creation of alien-human hybrid offspring. Now, Dr. Mack believes, and this is after, uh, after doing many, many case studies with people who say they were abducted by UFOs, uh, he believes that space aliens have a genetic engineering program going on. Well, J.R., we would modify his statement in just one simple way by saying, this is the same genetic engineering program that's been going on since Genesis chapter 6. It's not space aliens, it's demons, fallen angels. They are real. We know they're real. The Bible says they are. We know that angels are real. The Bible says they are. We have this UFO phenomena today. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, and there, there are too many reports, too many pictures being taken for it not to be something to it. And more and more pictures being taken every day, videotapes being made of flying objects. Uh, th these uh, creatures are progressively revealing themselves. Now, uh, again, we find ourselves running out of time, but J.R., we haven't even broached the subject of That's what right. the Bible calls chariots of fire. Yes. And next time, I really want to get into those chariots of yeah. fire. Elijah's yeah. chariot that took him to heaven. Yeah. Ezekiel's chariots that he saw on the plains of uh, mm -hmm. Shinar. And um, even in Isaiah 66, when it says, Behold, the Lord will come with fire and his chariots 
like a whirlwind. Like a whirlwind. Now, if you can imagine something that is uh, going through the sky and whirling in flames, what does that sound like? I mean, uh, let's face it, it sounds like something that's reported many, many times in the modern world. It's going to be a fascinating program. The next one we talk about as we conclude our study here. The interesting thing here is that Daniel has a book given to him and he says, close the book. In Revelation, we see the same man mm. opening the book. The man is Jesus Christ. Wow.